or our classes diminishing all the time. I, you know, <laughs> I guess it's getting too warm for people. Barbara. Um, really, you know, of all the chapters in, in that fabulous book, the one on dealing with orthodoxy, um, I have to admit I read it several times, several paragraphs several times, and I go, do not confuse, do not confuse. Particularly uh, the icon part, is that? Well, being of Eastern European persuasion, right. um, I kind of got the icon stuff, and they really just sort of touched on that a little bit. But the, the, the whole chapter just, I said to Marvin, I was really struggling with it. He said, oh, it gets better after that. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, he did. He's it always gets better. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that chapter just, really didn't cement it for me in terms of understanding the difference the difference um well you know, that that man is made in the image of god okay yeah and there were a lot of yeah ands and they just i, I think that even the author was struggling with i kind of got the impression that he didn't. yeah i um i'm going to get into that in more detail next week and i'll tell you why i i was going to start out with sort of a confession as I've been trying to prepare these, these classes, I, I put too much in each week. I struggled last week, I didn't get Augustine done, and I needed to because Augustine is, is the most important theologian in both Catholic and Protestant thinking. And so I'm going to talk about Augustine today, which means that I'm taking part off of today, which means I may not get to Gregory the Great, but I was going to talk a little bit about schisms today, but in terms of timeline, the, the great schism, which is the split between Eastern and Western Christianity, between Orthodoxy and Catholicism uh, in the 11th century, is one of the most important events. And I, I didn't want to try to squeeze that in today. Originally, when I said schism, I thought I'd get to the great schism. That would actually be jumping ahead a little bit, because you don't like start and take every year, because there's stuff happening that you, know, that you need to finish explaining and then you may have to double back to get something else. Next week I am going to spend a big chunk of the time talking about um, the schisms, uh, the, the big, the grand schism, and in doing so I will talk about all of the differences between Eastern and Western Christianity that led up to that. Because it is complicated. Um, well, but there's sort of a simple version and a complicated version. The simple version is in the West they spoke Latin, in the East, they spoke Greek. Both Constantinople and Rome thought their, their guy, the Pope in Rome and the Patriarch in Constantinople, should be number one. Because Rome had been the old capital, Constantinople became the new capital. So there were political reasons, really. Um, and then a lot of it had to do with uh, the, what had happened to the Western Kingdom, which we already talked about today, which the Western half of the, of the Roman Empire, that is. Um, and so there are a lot of complicated reasons. The, the, the reasons that they talk about, like the, the iconography, you know, the iconoclasm, actually the, the iconoclastic controversy was predominantly in the East. It had to do with what the emperors in Constantinople were doing, more so than what Rome was doing, because by the time the iconoclasm issue came along, even though Rome got involved in it, um, Rome was not very significant in terms of world affairs. I mean, it was all Constantinople at that point. And so it's mostly a conflict that happened in the East, even though the West had an opinion about it. Okay. Um, but we're going to get into that next week. Hang in there. <laughs> uh, some of it, you, you, again, one of the problems is that when you, talk, when you try to go over history as we're doing it, it's not a, a one straight timeline. You, know, you, have, you start an issue, and you have to take that issue to conclusion, and when you start the next issue, you may have to double back 400 years in order to give an explanation for where that started. And so we'll, we'll double back and, and deal with some of the differences leading up to the Great Schism next week. Okay? Yes? Um, is there um, a date or um, a time when there was actually the start of the Catholic Church? Um, the start of the Catholic Church, if you ask a Catholic, would have been in AD 30. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Catholic Church, and it's not unfair to say, the Catholic Church started in Jerusalem with the Apostles. Um, and that's why they consider themselves the Apostolic, Apostolic. Church. The, it, it's not like 
there were all these Christians, and then a bunch of them got together and said, okay, we're the Catholic Church now. The Catholic, it didn't happen that way. No. The Catholic Church, you know, the, the church started in Jerusalem, and it's moving forward. That moving forward part um, was the church. And then at a certain point, it split in two, east and west. But it's not like one of them got oh. created at that point. It's, it's, like, it's like a river is flowing, and at some point it splits into two rivers. Well, it's not that one of the rivers starts there. They both start back where the first river started, mm -hmm. okay? Yes. They split, and then, and that's what happened when Orthodoxy and Catholicism split off. They go a little further, and Orthodoxy splits into Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental, Oriental Orthodoxy, and Catholicism splits in, stays Catholicism, but you get Protestantism coming up, and then Protestantism brings up in all sorts of little tiny creeks that are really ugly. Okay. Um, but you can't say that one of them started in a certain place. They all started in the same place and then just sort of split off. It's like Catholic friends of ours. Um, we, were, we were having conversations, which we always did, and they said, well, if you don't believe in the in infallibility of the Pope or the power of the magisterium as equal to Scripture, then from where do you get your authority? And I said, well, from the historic interpretations of the church, like the creeds. And they said, which creeds? And I said, starting with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. One of our Catholic friends says, well, those are our creeds. You can't claim those. <laughs> and I said, well, there are creeds, too. You know, at that point, we were all one. That doesn't mean that when Protestantism split off, that we no longer had claim to the original history of the church. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. Yes, you sort of addressed what I was going to ask. I wanted, wanted to know if you could, a little bit more detail on how the church got to the East, beyond uh, Greek Orthodox, etc., okay. how it got to Russia, etc. We'll talk about how it got to Russia. It started in the East. The question is how it got to the West. <laughs> because, of course, it started in Jerusalem, which is in the East, what we call the Middle East, what they call the ancient Near East. And then it sort of started wrapping itself around the Mediterranean Sea, up into Asia Minor, and then Greece, down into Egypt, and then what we know of as Libya, you know, North Africa, Numidia, Mauritania, etc. We're going to talk about Augustine today, uh, one of the great saints and theologians of the church, and he was North African. He was from North Africa, his, his um, episcopate was in Hippo, a major city. We don't think of that as being a Christian part of the world. But all of that was the Christian world long before Christianity even came to Europe, uh, other than Greece. I mean, before it got to Western Europe, so that it's our roots. And then, you know, it, it, it traveled further, further west into Western Europe. Um, from there, and I, I mean, I'll touch today because we'll, we'll get into the. We're going to talk about the barbarians today, uh, and I've noticed it's very interesting. Um, one of the other books that I'm using. The edition I have printed is a more recent edition. I have the Kindle edition, which I cut, can cut, I use that because I can cut and paste. Well, the Kindle edition is older. It's, a, it's an earlier edition. They've come back and edited it. One of the things I've noticed is, in the old edition, they call them the Barbarians. In the new edition, they call them the Germanic tribes, which I guess is more politically correct. Okay. Wow. So, but the idea of the, the Germanic tribes or barbarians, because not all of them were Germanic. I mean, some of them were Franks, the French, and you know, various other places. Um, they, um, when they sort of things sort of broke down in, in terms of the Christianity continuing to grow from Asia Minor, the question was. Well, where do we go now? We can't go any further. We can't go west because the pagan barbarians, who very shortly became Christian, by the way. We, but we've been sort of stopped in our Western evangelism motion. Where do we go? Let's go north, Russia. Let's go east. You know, into uh, various parts of uh, other north. You know, other parts. Russia's big. You know, Russia, Ukraine, Russia, etc. Belarus, the countries that we think of now, former Soviet Union. Um, and much of that was because the direction that they were going, which seemed fairly easy, which was west into Europe, got stopped in the 5th century because of the barbarians. So was that through uh, uh, monasteries and monks traveling Some as, of it, as missionaries or through war efforts? Uh, not war efforts. Christianity did not expand by, by military means, unlike Islam. Right. Um, there are times when Christianity expanded by, by uh, a ruler like Clovis of the Moravians, or the Tsar, okay? Um, the, the Tsar of Russia, who converted, well, the whole country converted with him, this idea of mass conversion, because they followed the direction of their leader. But it wasn't because Christianity showed up with an army and said, you know, you have to become Christian, or you know, 
which is what Islam did in a lot of cases. Um, but for the most part, uh, the it was missionaries that were sent. Pope Gregory, for for instance, Gregory the Great, um, we, he was a great sending pope. He sent um, various missionaries. Benedict, for instance, he sent to the Germanic tribes in the north um, to convert them, and that's one of the reasons why these Germanic tribes or barbarian tribes, depending on which edition of the book you're reading, um, why they were converted is there were people who had very specific missionary assignments. They went to them as missionaries. Patrick. Um, who had been a slave in Ireland, he was actually British, uh, from England that is, um, went back on an assignment, you know, from, from the Pope and various others. Uh, Columba was then sent by Patrick and others to, to evangelize the Scots. So a lot of it was individuals, or in some cases small parties, that would go to a place and preach, you know, preach the, the, the word and people would be converted. Um, in the case of the Russians, you mentioned Russia, um, the Tsar was very interested because these missionaries, so he sent a group of his emissaries to Constantinople. And I just remembered something I was going to do today. I'll do it next week when we talk about the Eastern Church. And that is some photographs of the Hagia, Hagia Sophia. Okay? Um, when these emissaries from the Tsar went to Constantinople and they went into the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom that Constantine had, had, had started and then been remodeled later, later, and they said, this is heaven on earth. The incense was the smell of heaven, the dome of the Hagia Sophia, which the, the, if you get an idea, this was built in the 500s, and the Statue of Liberty could stand upright under the dome of this building that has been around for 1,500 years, wow. minus her torch, you know, she has to take her torch out of her hand. But the design of it, they say the dome looks like it just floats in heaven. And so the Tsar's emissaries go to the Hagia Sophia, they go to Constantinople, they see this wealth and this opulence and, this, and all of this represented by the Eastern Christian faith. They go back to the Tsar and say, you got to buy into this thing, okay? <laughs> and so they were so enamored of the, of the Eastern Roman Empire. Remember, this is still the Roman Empire. We called it the Byzantine Empire, but it's still the Roman Empire. And the, the emperor in Constantinople was the Roman emperor. And so the idea that this is Rome is where Tsar, Tsar is a Russian version of Caesar. And so even the title of the, of the, the king of Russia was taken at that point. When the Tsar converted to Christianity, they wanted to do everything they can to copy it, even to the titles of the royalty, okay? because they were so impressed with the Eastern Christian Empire as represented in Constantinople. And it's still a pretty cool place. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? I'll start preaching all kinds of stuff here. Any other questions? Okay, now let me open in prayer. Father, we are truly grateful again for your blessings. We pray that you would guide my words today. May the thoughts come together and gel in ways that people hear your great act through history. And that even when we have been broken vessels, you have been the true and living water that will fill us and guide us through history. We pray that you would direct us now through your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. This is our schedule. Uh, what happened? There it is. Oh, we just did that weird thing. Hold on just a second. <laughs> I don't know why you just did this in the middle set. You see that split on the right hand yeah. side? You won't be able to read any of the slides unless I do this. <coughs> just talk amongst yourselves. What do you have to do when such things happen? I have to un uh, I have to unplug that and plug it back in and start again. I'm glad I'm not the only one who has strange fixes for strange occurrences. Oh, yes, we're all right. We're all right now. I'm trying to match the color. Crazy. What am I thinking? Okay. We're back. Um, this is our. Uh -oh. Uh, just try plugging it back in and see what that does. I didn't even hit any buttons or anything. I don't know why it's going bizarre on us. Searching. It doesn't look like it's working. Uh, it takes a second. <coughs> um, so. Okay, let me close in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> I 
just I just escaped out. Okay, plug it back in. I wasn't touching any buttons, oh, that's the thing. Were... <laughs> <laughs> but, but it seemed like when you were trying to, but I was apparently not. Your thing was oh, loose, that. you know, the, yeah. the battery and stuff is just all yeah. a bit loose. Okay, let's see if this will work. So this is our schedule, of course, for the classes, which is beginning to mean almost nothing to me. Um, <laughs> today we're supposed to talk about schisms. Barbarians and Gregory the Great. I'm going to talk about the Donatus heresy, which I've mentioned before, but it's important when we talk about Augustine, because I'm going to start with Augustine, which we didn't get last week. Um, we will talk about barbarians. I may, um, I may talk a little bit more about monasticism <coughs> and the popes. Monasticism, especially because when we discussed monasticism earlier, we talked about the Egyptian origins. That is the, um, both the anchorite, that is the solitary hermit monks, and then the um, Cenobitic, the communities of monastic orders that started in, in Egypt. But when it moved to Europe, it had a very significant influence on the European history. And so we may touch on that a little bit today as well. I probably will not get to Gregory the Great today. I may include that next week as we get into discussion of the Eastern and Western Church, because Gregory was a significant player in terms of establishing the Western Church even after the destruction of, of the Western Empire, per se. Okay? So, I'll stick to this as much as I can, but I ain't promising nothing. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's talk about Augustine of Hippo. I'll start out by saying the reason I have to get him in here, Augustine became uh, not only the most important theologian of the Catholic Church, the most important probably of all the Latin fathers. Now when I talk about Latin fathers, that means those who were from the West and spoke Latin, as opposed to those from the East and spoke Greek. Now you might not think of Augustine as being from the West, because he was, from, he, he was bishop of the city of Hippo, there really is a city called Hippo, at least there was, in North Africa, and he had come from North Africa. He went to school in the Carthage. Bless you. Um, but that part of the world, North Africa, had been, because of the Roman Empire conquering North Africa, they spoke Latin instead of Greek. So Greek, Greek was predominant down into probably Egypt. You know, Alexandria, of course, spoke Greek because that was Alexander's city. But you go further west in North Africa, and you get into what we know of as Libya, Mauritania, and Numidia, some of the other places, those places had been sort of stabilized and civilized, if you would, by the Roman Empire, and so they were Latin-speaking. So he's considered a Latin father. Um, a little bit of history. Augustine was born, I know this is small, but I had to get it all on there. You can always pull it up on your screens at home and see in big, big letters. Uh, Augustine was born in 354 in Tagaste, North Africa. Um, his mother, Monica, was a further Christian, and she became Saint Monica. All right? She was a strong influence on his life. Some people would say too much of an influence. She was a, a, an, an overpressing mother part of his life. Um, his father was a casual pagan, and one of Monica's great <coughs> desires in, in her life was the conversion of her husband, which eventually happened. Eventually, um, Augustine's pagan father did become a Christian. Um, the... His parents were of fairly modest means, but they determined that Augustine was going to re receive the very best education he could. So he studied uh, first in a city not far from where he was born, and then studied rhetoric. Um, rhetoric is communications, is the simplest way to say it. Uh, we don't have rhetoric as a topic anymore in schools, but it had to do with how to think clearly and how to communicate. Uh, com communicate. <laughs> I have a degree in communication. <laughs> Uh, how to communicate clearly and effectively. Uh, rhetoric was, was thought to uh, clarify your ability to think and to communicate. The great speakers of Rome, you know, Cicero, by the way, you think it's Cicero, but if you speak Latin, it's actually Cicero, right, Carolyn? That's right. Uh, so, <laughs> so, I taught him that. The great, uh, the great speakers, uh, philosophers, the, the ones who were, you know, the 
the Friends are almost country kind of stuff. That's a product of a rhetorician, somebody who has the ability to communicate uh, beautifully. So Augustine studied rhetoric in Carthage, which was the major city of North Africa. It was a Latin-speaking uh, city, and he studied communication. But that as he studied, and he was apparently a very good student, and he was a, he was a bright guy, uh, he also pursued other pleasures, particularly he had a concubine, as they called him in those days, or a mistress, as we would call them, although he wasn't married. And he had a child, uh, um, uh, Adiatidus, by that mistress. And so his mistress, he lived with his mistress, he lived with his illegitimate son, um, and was, was, a, was a great student. He started reading philosophy, particularly, I mentioned him already, Cicero. Cicero, he started reading because Cicero was famous as a rhetorician, you know, somebody who was uh, an expert in rhetoric. But Cicero also happened to be a philosopher. And so he started reading Cicero because he was a rhetorician, and that was, that was what uh, Augustine was studying. But he started believing and reading Cicero's writings that the point of life wasn't just to sell people on stuff by being a good communicator, but rather to have content to back it up, to have some truth that's worthy to communicate. Um, and so the pursuit of truth became his life's goal. Early on, even though his mother was Christian, he did not go in that direction. Early on, he started following a belief system called Manichaeism. It was started by a guy named Mani, believe it or not, M-A-N-I, or Mani, who was Persian. And uh, Manichaeism was a kind of Gnosticism. You remember we talked about Gnosticism as one of the early heresies in the second century. I believe it was even, even dominant, even present, and significantly in the first century because Paul addresses it, etc. But Manichaeism started in Persia, and Mani was, it's a dualistic religion, believing that there are forces of light and forces of darkness, that there is, like Gnosticism, that the physical world is evil and is, is of darkness, and the spiritual world is good and is of light. So the idea was to pursue the goodness and the light in the spiritual side and to downplay the physical side. Um, the, the particulars of Manichaeism was that it, that it was especially anti-Christian. And this is one of the reasons that Augustine was attracted to it, because he had two real problems with the idea of, um, of Christianity. And he became a Manichaean, he went to Rome for a short time, and, and they didn't pay him enough, so he moved to Milan in Italy as a teacher. And in Milan, um, particularly, he got involved in Neoplatonism, that is, the new Platonic thought, follow, following the ideas of Plato. And Plato, for instance, believed in the eternal, uh, eternal existence of the soul. He also believed in one God. Did you know that? In fact, a lot, as we've said before, a lot of the early Christian thinkers and philosophers, the apologists, one of the things they, they would do is to take like Platonism and even Stoicism, two of the most popular um, Greek philosophies, and explain how they were actually consistent with Christianity, it's just they needed a little bit more Jesus. <laughs> but that the principles behind them were very consistent. Eternal soul, one God, you know, that there is truth that can be discovered, all those sorts of things. Well. Uh, after being a Manichaean for like nine years, when he went to Rome and Milan, started studying Neoplatonism, he <laughs> discovered that Neoplatonism answered his doubts about evil, because Neoplatonism believes that there is a central good. And uh, he, Manichaeism made fun of Christianity because it said, okay, where did evil come from? If everything was made by a good God, did God make something evil? Ah, that didn't sound right. And he also had problems with the Bible, because he would read as a rhetorician to present things beautifully and to present things that are noble. You know, they had ideas of nobility in communication. And you read in the Old Testament, especially about rape and, you know, and incest and, and animal sacrifice and all this horrid stuff. Those were the two big problems that Augustine had with Christianity. What was the source of evil? And how do you deal with all of these kind of gross stories, especially in the Old Testament? Neoplatonism gave him an answer to the first one. Because Neoplatonism says the source of all things, the supreme being, is good. But as things get further away from God, I'll use that term, the supreme being, as they get further away from God, they are less good. And then those who do evil 
are not looking toward God, they're looking away from God. And the further they look away from God, the further they get away from God, things become darker and they become more evil. Neoplatonism gave them an explanation for how evil could exist when everything was made by a good God, because evil is, some, is, is a characteristic of having moved away from the good. Okay? It's not a thing that is that a material thing, which is what Manichaeism said. And then, he, when he's in Milan, he teaches rhetoric. The most famous speaker, probably in all of Italy at that point, was a bishop, Ambrose of Milan. He was a renowned preacher, a great communicator. So his uh, mother, Monica, who living with him, uh, and probably his mistress and their, his illegitimate son, uh, she convinces Augustine to go and listen to the sermons of Ambrose of Milan. And he agrees to go at first because Ambrose has a reputation for being a great communicator, and he wants to see how he does it. But as he goes, he finds out over a period of time, he's not just listening to the style and the presentation, he starts listening to the message. And Ambrose was famous for giving allegorical explanations for Old Testament stories especially. Remember we talked about allegory. Was it in this class or one of the others? Okay, this class. Where you take a, you take a story from the Bible and everything means something else. Everything is a symbol for something else. So all of these kind of gross stories that Augustine had so much trouble with, Ambrose preached on them and taught on them as allegory, and all of a sudden uh, Augustine was okay with that. So his two big objections had been dealt with. He had no more reason not to want to become a Christian except for one thing. He sort of liked having a mistress and fooling around. He's famous for saying at this point in his life, Lord, make me chaste. But not yet. <laughs> um, he struggled with that. You know, he liked women, and he, he liked you know, uh, in in ways that were not acceptable to the Christian faith. He believed that if he was going to become a Christian, he was going to do it all the way. He wasn't going to be lukewarm. And in his day, all the way meant he would practice some sort of asceticism, particularly deny himself certain physical pleasures. And he struggled with doing that. And of course, his, his, his mother Monica is poking him all, the whole time, you know, to become a Christian, because she's really fervent in this stuff. So, he finally, <coughs> the story is that he walked into his garden one day when he was really struggling with this, and he's really struggling with this. Okay? And he heard a child's voice saying, sort of sing song, kind of, and it said, take up and read, take up and read, take up and read. So he picked up a Bible, and he opened it up, and he started reading it. And he decided, this is true, and he became a Christian. He made that commitment. He renounced his concubine, we never even found out what her name was. He kept his son, but she left. Um, he started uh, attending church regularly with Ambrose. Ambrose, he went through the, cate uh, the catechesis, the training. He was baptized as a Christian. Um, after he became a Christian, he decided to renounce his teaching role and become a monk. He was going to take this seriously. He's going to do it. So he travels back to North Africa. He returns to North Africa. Um, actually, I put the myself there. Um, as they're on their way, they stop at a city, and his mother Monica dies en route. And he's so stricken by this, he goes back to Rome and spends months in Rome trying to recover from that. A short time later, his son, Adiatidas, dies. And so he's had this double blow, and he's determined to go back to uh, Africa, because remember, in Egypt, that's where all the monks were. So he's going to go back to Africa in a monastic life. He goes back to Africa, and when he's in Africa, he visits the town of Hippo one day. Well, he already had developed a little bit of a reputation of being a very spiritual monk. Well, in, he's in the congregation, and the bishop, um, uh, Valeris, I think it's Valeris, if I remember correctly, these names, they all sort of run together. Um, does the... Not too soon, I guess. Hang on a second. I want to make sure I get that right. Valerius. That was close. Valerius sees him in the congregation and knows he's a monk and knows he's serious as a monk. Well, Valerius preaches on the fact that when God needs ministers for his church, he will send them. And he's looking right at Augustine. Augustine doesn't want to be a, a minister. He does not want to have responsibilities for a church. He doesn't want to be a pastor. Well, Valerius 
railroads him into becoming a pastor and he, against his will. And so he becomes a pastor. A short time later, Valerius, has, who's the bishop, has Augustine named co-bishop. So there's two bishops. And the reason Valerius did it is because there was a rule in the church at that point that a bishop could not leave the city where he was bishop without permission. I mean, he could only, you know, he'd have to get the, like a church council to agree that he could leave his position. <coughs> Valerius sort of overlooked the fact there was also a rule about having two bishops in one city. But uh, because he, he got a name co-bishop, then Augustine couldn't leave. He had to stay there. Not too long after that, Valerius dies. Augustine is the bishop, and he takes over pastoral responsibilities. Well, part of his pastoral responsibilities, he felt, was to write out theology, to write what we believe as part of sermons and teaching and things like that. He started doing that, and in a very short order, people started realizing this guy is something special. Um, he's not only a great communicator, because he'd studied rhetoric, that was his gig, but he also was very theological. Uh, and he, he starts writing theology, and in particular, um, and he, he very soon becomes the most influential theologian in all the Latin-speaking churches. Now, this is the end of the fourth, the start of the fifth century. Interestingly enough, one of the first things that he does in terms of focused theology is he refutes the beliefs of the Manichaeans. What happened is in the nine years, uh, I think it was nine years, that he was, he was a follower of Manichaeism, he convinced some of his friends to become Manichaeans. Now that he's a Christian, he doesn't believe in that anymore. And he feels a real responsibility to try to convince people that this is wrong, that that's not what you should believe. And so he, he develops a very specific kind of uh, apology. Remember, apology doesn't mean I'm sorry. It means an argument in defense of something. An apology for Christianity and against Manichaeism. Very similar to some of the things that have been said uh, previously with regard to response to Gnosticism. But most especially, one of the things the Manichaeans had said is that human beings have no free will. You know, you are a victim of the forces of light and of darkness in the world. And the best you can do is to sort of surrender yourself and hope that you can fall into the light and be released from the, the uh, imprisonment into a physical body. Um, because that was one of the major principles of Manichaeism, Augustine developed a theology of free will that argued against all of that, and his argument of free will became a fundamental platform later in the Protestant Reformation. Augustine became the most important theologian to the Catholic Church, the one they looked to more than any other, partly because he was the predominant Latin speaking, and when you had the split occur between Eastern Orthodoxy and Western Catholicism, Western Catholicism wanted to focus more on the Latin-speaking Western theologians, and of them, Augustine was number one. And his theology was very sound, and it was very well communicated, and so he became significant to the Catholics, but then when, the, when Martin Luther and others came along for the Protestant Reformation, they go, because they were trained as Catholics, <laughs> obviously, um, Luther was a monk, he was an Augustinian monk, he goes back to the writing of Augustine and goes, look what he says about free will. Look how he quotes Paul, the Apostle, in Galatians and in Ephesians, and uh, this, I don't think you guys are living up to this anymore. And so Augustine became very important because of his, uh, to the Reformation because of his emphasis on free will. Um, it also was the case that um, Augustine ended up arguing against Donatism. I'm going to get into what that means in just a second. Um, it was a major divisive controversy centered in North Africa, where <laughs> Augustine was, that caused a split in the church that lasted hundreds of years. In fact, every effort by the, the, the church during Augustine's time to wipe it out was not successful. The Roman Empire tried to wipe it out with troops, didn't, didn't happen. The Byzantine, once, once that was the whole of the Roman Empire, they sent troops, conquered the area, tried to wipe it out, couldn't do it. The only thing that finally ended up ending this controversy after hundreds of years was that, <laughs> that North Africa, bless you, was that North Africa was conquered by the Muslims. The Muslims did away with it because they did away with Christianity. And Donatism was a heresy, but it was still part of Christianity. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, the... And finally, probably um, 
his greatest, Augustine's greatest set of theological arguments was against Pelagianism. Pelagius was a monk from Britain who became famous for his piety and for his austerity. He, I, people idealized him as being the ideal Christian. Well, for all of his lifestyle, Pelagius saw the Christian life as one in which um, a person could, by an act of will, overcome sin. He said there was no such thing as original sin. Babies were born clean, Pelagius did, and that sin only happened when they made the decision, the choice to do sinful things, and by an act of will they could stop doing sinful things and therefore be forgiven for them. Obviously, this kind of messed up the doctrines of original sin, of the full, of the full atonement by Jesus, not by our own efforts. You know, by grace you are saved through faith. It is a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, Pelagius very plainly said you have the ability to not sin. You can be sin-free if you just work at it enough. Well, Augustine jumped into that and said and talked about the fact that, that when we are in sin, we are wholly in sin. Later on, this gets interpreted as the doctrine of total depravity, it was called. Meaning we are all, apart from the, from the, uh, the grace of Jesus Christ coming into our lives, we are in no way righteous on our own. We are completely fallen. We are completely depraved and in sin. And so he developed that idea, um, and that again became a fundamental platform of the Reformation, of Protestantism. The idea that we are sinners, and our only hope is in Jesus Christ as he enters into us. And we cannot by ourselves make ourselves one bit better. Pelagius, who had gotten very popular, claimed you could. And so Augustine's theology against Pelagius... The idea that it is by grace we are saved, that it is not our own efforts, that we are unable to make ourselves better by our own efforts, became a basic platform of the Catholic faith for a long time. Although, again, one of the reasons the Reformation happened is Luther and others said, you guys are not paying attention to your own theology anymore. Go back and read Augustine again. All right, now, this is a thousand years later that uh, that's Luther and others are saying that. Because remember that... It's in the late 300s. Actually, his theology was mostly written in the early 400s, and it wasn't until 1500 that the Reformation happened. So we're talking over a thousand years later. Um, but his doctrines, having to do with free will, with original sin, with uh, the necessity of grace in our lives, our inability to cure ourselves of our own sinfulness, all of those became fundamental theological platforms of the Christian faith. And then we're especially responsible for, for the Protestant movement. Okay? Got that? Um, it's, it's not too much to say that, well, I, I guess I should say too, that other people came along later, when I say that they were paying attention to his theology, other people came along later and called themselves Augustinians, but started changing what Augustine had to say. Um, and they, they took away some of the hard edge. For instance, Augustine's thinking took him to predestination. That grace is entirely from God, and we can't do anything to save ourselves, and so therefore, you know, God has elected those to be saved. Well, that predestination is what people had trouble with, and so you end up with what's, what's called semi-Pelagians. They accepted everything Augustine said, but they didn't like part of it, and so they were semi-Augustinian and semi-Pelagian. And that became kind of a dominant theme through the church for a long, long time. Two of Augustine's books that are very important um, one is the Confessions, which is his story of his own conversion, <coughs> his own faith. It is written from the perspective um, of an address of prayer to God. It's considered the first autobiography ever written. And Carolyn's reading it right now. What do you think, Carolyn? It's written, uh, the translation I have anyway, is written in like King James English. It's oh. very hard <laughs> to, yeah. to, to work through. But well, I'm halfway through it. And it, it, it is interesting, but it's... Yeah, there are more modern translations. So Oh, there are? Yeah. Okay. I, have, I didn't um, have one. Oh, good. Yeah. So if the language is bothering you, that's not his fault since he wrote in Latin. So, um, <laughs> it's amazing I can understand any of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but again, one of the first autobiographies, and it's a spiritual autobiography. It is the first autobiography he's considered. And the other book he wrote is The City of God. I've mentioned that before. The City of God he wrote because in 410 A.D., right in the middle of his ministry life, uh, Rome was sacked 
And when Rome was sacked, everybody saw Rome as being the center of the universe, the eternal city. It was the home of the Christian faith. It was where the emperor lived. It was everything. It was out of Rome that the whole Roman Empire, sort of civilization defined, had come. And when these, these pagan barbarians conquered Rome, Christians all over Europe thought that the world had ended. You know, this is the end of the world. It's just a matter of any hour now. You know, the whole thing's going to blow up. The Lord's going to come back. It's all going to end. All sorts of refugees from um, Rome came to Hippo, which is just across the Mediterranean Sea. They sailed south to Carthage and Hippo, and a lot of them were refugees from the siege of the, of the barbar barbarians. And so Augustine felt this responsibility to help people understand this. And so he wrote the City of God. And the City of God is basically a, a kind of a vast encyclopedic history of how God has acted in creating earthly cities and also in creating, according to the biblical model, especially in Revelation, a city of God, a heavenly city. And he compares the, the heavenly city and the earthly city. The heavenly city is built upon all that is good. And it is, its focus is God. The earthly city is a product of pride. Sort of like the Tower of Babel. You know, see the wonderful things we're able to do? And that the mistake that people always made was they think that the earthly city and the, the survival of the earthly city was necessary for civilization and righteousness and for God's will to be done. And Augustine's whole point of the city of God is that, no, the earthly city is temporary. And by its very nature is, is ungodly in many ways, even though God continues to work in history. And that our focus should not be on the earthly city, and particularly he's talking about Rome having been just destroyed, or at least sacked, it wasn't actually destroyed, but rather our focus should be on the city of God, the heavenly city. That's the thing we hope for. Our hope is not built on the earthly cities, okay? Uh, very, very significant and influential. Augustine is considered the last of the great leaders of the Western Imperial Church because um, while he was dying, the Vandals, that's a, that's a tribe of people, that's one of those barbarian tribes who eventually controlled all of North Africa and a big part of Italy, um, the Vandals were besieging the city of Hippo where he lived even while he was on his deathbed. And it was the mark of the end, the dying of the Western Empire. Okay. I'm going to get into that, into the other Germanic tribes, which I don't think even is accurate because I believe it's more than that. It was the uh, barbarian tribes is more accurate. And so much of history ends up being so politically correct. You can't call the Dark Ages the Dark Ages because that sounds judgmental. Well, rightly so. The lights went off, went out in Western Europe. Okay, people forgot how to read. People didn't live in cities anymore for fear that they would be, you know, uh, they'd be a target. And you know. The whole western part of the civilization went into the dark. You're not supposed to call it the Dark Ages anymore. And I think that it's fair to say barbarian tribes because not all of them were Germanic. That's unfair to the Germans, don't you think, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Bob's always very sensitive when I say things about, about the Germans. Um, I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about one of these heresies because historically it was important, and that is the, the, the heresies that Augustine addressed, and that is Donatism. Um, you will remember that the, one of the big challenges the her church faced during and after the persecutions, especially under Decius and Valerian and Diocletian, is what do we do with these people who renounce the faith after the persecution stops and they want to come back to the church? There were two very distinct kind of approaches. One group said if they really have confessed and want to come back to the church, in the same way that Jesus allowed Peter to be reconciled even after he betrayed him, we should accept their confession and, and take them back into the church. That was one extreme. The other extreme was absolutely not. These people are damned to hell forever and they can never come back into the church. In the middle, there were people who said, okay, there are varying degrees. Um, there are those who, who just renounce the faith immediately without any struggle. Um, they're the worst. There are others who, you will remember, they, they, they had certificates called libellum. And you could buy those to say that you had uh, sacrificed to the gods when you had. Well, that clearly wasn't as bad a sin as actually having sacrificed to the gods. And then there were others who were still alive, who had been tortured and tormented, never did give up the faith. 
So how do you deal with these different ones? Uh, this had led to a, a schism in the third century. We're now into the end of the fourth and into the fifth century. In the third century, this had led to a split in Rome, in the church in Rome, called the no Novation Schism, where uh, a, a man who was an elder in the church, uh, Novation, thought that the elder was being too easy, in, uh, that bishop was being too easy, and so he had himself declared bishop by some other bishops, so you had two bishops, and then two parties, and that lasted for a number of years, because, and it was over this issue of do we let them back in or not, and if we do let them back in, what are the, what are the qualifications for them coming back in? This is where, this struggle was where the whole doctrine of penance, the idea that if you've committed a sin, you have to do something that is in some way sacrificial, and originally it meant, you know, you had to, to um, confess before everybody and, you know, and fast and, you know, do some sort of serious penance. Nowadays, the idea of, okay, say three Hail Marys and, you know, put an extra five in, in the bin as you go out, um, people think that's ridiculous. But there was a historical reason why that happened, because it was an effort to try to figure out how do we go through some process of some kind to bring these people back into the church. Well, in North Africa, the, the division over this letting people back into the church was much more serious than it was anywhere else. In fact, it became very violent. Um, the persecution in North Africa had been very bad. There were a lot of people who had yielded, who had given in and sacrificed to the gods. And so later on, one of the things that under, under um, Decius, they were asking that people turn over Bibles, Holy Scripture. Well, some of the bishops handed over heretical documents that weren't Bibles, claiming that they were the Christian scriptures. Well, the pagan Romans didn't know the difference. Um, and, but then others actually did turn over Bibles. They turned over Holy Scripture. So the really strict guys later who really wanted to judge these people, they said, well, if the Re book of Revelation says that anyone is cursed who adds, a, you know, uh, adds or takes away anything from that, how much more serious would it be to turn it over to let it be destroyed? So there was a strong sense that the people who had turned over Scripture, the people who had denied the faith, needed to be punished in some way by the church, not be let back in. Well, this got more complicated because um, there was a, a case in Carthage. Remember, that's where uh, Augustine went to school. That was the biggest city in North Africa. In Carthage, they, had a, they had a, needed a new bishop. They elected a bishop called Cecilian. And he was more liberal, more easygoing. He was not popular with the rigorist party, the ones who really wanted to be hard on these people who denied the faith. So because they didn't like the fact that he, they thought he was too easy, they elected their own bishop, uh, whose name was Margarinus. Um, Margarinus died shortly after that, apparently natural causes. I don't think he was murdered or anything. So they elected another, another new second bishop named Donatus. Donatus is where the Donatism as a heresy, as a schism, the name came from. So the bottom line is, when they have these two bishops, Cecilian, the, the, the first bishop that was named, he appeals to other bishops around the, the church for verification that he's the true bishop, and they all side with him pretty much. Well, that just makes Donatus mad, and his followers mad. So they say, they appeal to the emperor. Well, the emperor, who's got a lot of other problems right then, he doesn't even bother with it. He said, okay, all these other bishops have said Cecilian is the right bishop, so therefore Cecilian is the right bishop. This had especially important consequences for Donatus and the people who were following him, because Constantine had just said, bishops and ministers of the church don't have to pay taxes, and they get a lot of free stuff, okay? Uh, they get housing allowances. And they get all kinds of stuff. Well, Donatus and the people following him, once the emperor said, you're not the right guy, you're not officially part of the church anymore at all, they lost all the bennies, all the perks were gone. So they were very serious about trying to address this. Because the rest of the church, almost all the rest of the church, and the emperor had said, you guys who want to be so severe and have set up your own bishop, you're wrong, and therefore you're not, you know, you're the ones that are on the outs now wanted to get rid of uh, Cecilian. They are struggling with this. Well, they start this other big argument. They say, well, we're going to argue this thing out. 
the Donatists say that one of the three bishops that had ordained Cecilian was a somebody who had turned over scripture. Uh, it was called the Traditor. He was a Traditor, similar to traitor. He had turned over uh, scripture to be burned. One of the three bishops. So the question came up. First, the, the, the supporters of Cecilian said, no, he wasn't a Traditor. And besides that, even if one of the three was, that would not make any difference over whether or not Cecilian was appropriately a bishop. See, the Donatists were saying, if even one of the guys that ordained you was not true to the faith, then no action that he took within the church is true. Well, the Sicilians say, wait a minute. If you're saying that the sacraments, and remember that ordination was a sacrament in the church, and was up until the Protestant Reformation. If you're saying that a bishop who is himself unworthy in some way, that the actions that he does, any sacrament he performs, is therefore not valid, then how do we know maybe the bishop that baptized me was having bad thoughts that day? <laughs> or the last time I took the sacrament of communion, maybe the guy had slept with somebody who wasn't his wife the night before, or whatever. The question came up of whether or not the validity of the sacraments of the church were dependent upon the righteousness of the people offering those sacraments, or whether it was based upon the righteousness of the church. Well, this is one of the arguments Augustine got into. And Augustine said, the sacraments of the church can never be seen as based upon the righteousness of the ministers, but rather on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Which obviously, obviously sounds true to us now. But this argument became so heated, the Donatists, eventually a sect or a party within the Donatists, uh, emerged who resorted to terrorism. They were so against. Now, you need to understand, too, that Constantine comes along. I talked last week about the monastic, uh, the, the real development of the monastic, was because some people thought having the emperor involved in this is ruining everything. You know, that, that it's become political. Bishops are, are vying for more important positions as though, as though this were a prize to be won. Powerful, rich people are running things. Well, the Donatists tended to be from further west in North Africa, Numidia and Mauritania, they tended to be agrarian, common folk, whereas the people that supported Sicilian, they tended to be from the cities, from Carthage and Hippo and some of the other larger areas. So there was a class division here. The people who were on the Donatist side claimed that this is one more example of the fact that the emperor being a Christian, or at least supporting Christianity, has ruined the faith and we've got to do something about it. We, and they were willing to become martyrs in the same way that the old persecuted people were martyrs. They would become martyrs by fighting against this injustice, this, this false church, they thought. Um, and it wasn't, um, it was kind of weird because history tells us that some of the people that were higher up in the Donatist movement had themselves uh, uh, committed apostasy, denied the faith. We have records of that. There's one of the guys who was senior in that, that it was widely known he had murdered his two nephews. So it's not like they were all pure and righteous on the Donatist side, but they were absolutely committed to this and so militant that after a period of time, a group developed within the Donatist movement called the Circumcellians. The Circumcellians were um, a group of terrorists. It got to the point in this part of North Africa that people were abandoning, the wealthy people were abandoning their estates and their land <laughs> in the countryside because they were being attacked on a regular basis. Nobody could travel through that part of the countryside without having a big band of escorts. These Circumcellians developed a small army and they would literally show up at the, at the gates of a city and demand that the city declare that Cecilian was not the bishop and Donatus was. Um, it became so bad that the economy of North Africa almost crumbled because while they grew the crops in Numidia and Mauritania, they shipped them out through Carthage. And when they had this conflict, there was no way to get the, get the, the crops and things out. The economy caved in. The whole thing was a mess. And as I say, these circumcellions, they were terrorists. They killed people over this issue. It became so bad that... One, like the, they sent an army from Rome to try to get rid of these guys. They were not successful. 
Later on, the emperor in Constantinople sent a Byzant uh, Byzantine army to try to conquer them. That didn't work. The Vandals, the, you know, the, the barbarians, the Germanic tribe, um, <laughs> takes over this part of North Africa. They try to wipe these Circumcellians and the Donatists out. They aren't successful. The only thing that ended it, and this is almost 400 years later, was the growth of Islam. When Islam takes over North Africa, they wipe out pretty much all of Christianity. In fact, one of the things that happened, when you realize that all of North Africa was Christian at one point, and it's all Muslim now, with very, very isolated differences. I mean, in Egypt, there is the Egyptian Coptic Church. You know, so there is, a, there is a Christian church in Egypt, but it's not the dominant church. Um, one of the reasons that Islam was successful in conquering North Africa quite rapidly is because um, they got there and you had the Arians, remember the Arian controversy that led to the Council of Nicaea? Arianism had not gone away. There were some people who were Arians. In fact, a lot of the barbarians, the Germanic tribes, that became Christian, they were converted by Arian ministers. So Arianism was still around. Then you had the Nicene or the Chalcedonian, that is the, the Orthodox Christian faith. Then you had the Donatists. In North Africa, you had three, at least three very different ideas as to what Christianity was, and they were fighting each other, and so the Muslims come in, and they don't really have any strong way to oppose them, because they're up together themselves. So uh, Donatism was one of the reasons why Islam ended up taking over all of North Africa. And again, Augustine is one of the ones who argued against that, and in doing so, his, again, his significance Augustine established the nature, he really laid the platform for future ecclesiology, that is, how does the church work, in terms of where is the authority in the church? Is it in the individual, who is, who is supposed to be a righteous person to order, to, to be able to offer uh, sacraments, or is it somewhere else? Okay. And Augustine is the one who clarified all that. Any questions about all that? <laughs> I heard that Barbara Mercy. Sorry. <laughs> it's heavy. That's yeah. A lot of uh, but, and, and I'm sorry that there's so much detail in that, but you can understand how little pieces like that, the fact that all of North Africa very quickly fell to Islam is partly because of this controversy. And it also, it was this controversy that called, caused Augustine to really establish the principles under which the authority of the church were later firmly established. When he said, you know, what, what is the basis of the authority within the church? Is it in the individual or not? And they said it's not. Um, so that was important. Now, with the uh, Islam uh, coming through and changing, well, did they do it, did they do it by force? Yes. So yeah, it was military conquest. It was military conquest, and and because of the all the divisions. It was easy. Yeah, there was no unified Christian army to fight them. Um, and so next week, before I actually get into the, the Great Schism, I'm going to talk about, and again, they don't say the Islamic conquest, they say the Arabic conquest. Arabic. Politically more correct. Um, <laughs> the, it started in Arabia, of course. And so, but it, the Islamic armies is what it was. Um, swept across North Africa and all the way up into, into Western Europe. And then swept north through, uh, from Arabia, through Palestine, uh, Syria, and all of Asia Minor, okay? So this was happening with the Islamic armies. Um, and I'll show you some slides next week because uh, I want to talk about that. It's very easy to understand why the Crusades happened. When you look at two slides that are 100 years apart and you see where Christianity existed and then, you know, in 600 and then in 700, the fact that so much of that had been conquered, militarily conquered by Islam, and you're sitting in the middle of Europe, and you're the you're you're the bishop of Rome, the pope, and you go, if we don't do something, you know, we're all going to be speaking Arabic here pretty quick, um, and you just need to understand that as a historical reality. So we'll look at that too. Uh, let's take a break. Okay. Let me say that um, this may seem like an awful lot of detail, and maybe I'm getting into too much detail in some of this, but recognizing that that. There are aspects of this that you may never have heard of before, and I'm trying to introduce you to some of it, because each, each piece of this is like a, you know, a block that other things are built on, and you need to have some understanding of it. For instance, Donatism, not only was that an, um, the thing that motivated, as I said, Augustine to be able to address 
some of the ecclesiastical foundations of the, how the church was going to understand itself, but it ended up being one of the reasons that North Africa was so easily conquered by the, the, by the Muslims. And so by itself, you may say, well, that, that ended in the 7th century, but it was significant historically. And so forgive me if I get into too much detail on that stuff. I find all no, that stuff it's interesting. Great. So. No, great. And our camera's on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about barbarians, <laughs> or Germanic tribes. <laughs> Um, there were a lot of different tribes from the areas around the Roman Empire. In fact, throughout the history of the Roman Empire, much of the effort that Rome had to exert was to try to protect its borders. Um, some of the most significant events in the history of the Roman Empire was when either Rome conquered a barbarian people, that's what brought Julius Caesar to power as the first absolute dictator of Rome. It had been a, a you know, republic. <coughs> And then Caesar was so successful in defeating the barbaric enemies of Rome that he was made Caesar, king. Um, and that changed the whole way things ran from then on. There are other cases where when Roman legions were defeated by barbarian peoples, that affected both the, who was in power and the direction that the empire would go. So there always, once, once the Roman Empire grew, the Roman Empire was fighting the Scottish barbarians in um, in. Great Britain, that's why Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian, built the wall to try to keep him out after finally figuring out he wasn't going to beat them um, because it, it's like trying to nail a jellyfish to the wall. They were everywhere and you know it's very hard to fight them. Um, and the Germanic tribes in the north, a whole crossing of the Rubicon kind of thing to battle the barbarians. Um, and even over into some of the some of the tribes, like the Huns that came out of Asia and crossed all the way over Asia and Europe in order to attack European <coughs> cities. We need to understand that it's not just that all of these tribes, these tribal peoples, were looking to try to, to sack and burn and rape and pillage. Some of them just wanted to find a better place to live. And they saw the glories of Rome, the wealth of Rome. They're building cities and bridges and, and, and roads, unbelievable stuff. And so a lot of these, um, Barbarian tribes simply wanted some place to live where they could have that kind of civilization. That's really what they wanted, which is one of the reasons that not all of the barbarians that could have sacked all the cities. Um, the story that we told of Pope Leo, when Attila the Hun arrived outside the gates and Pope Leo went out to meet him, we don't know what they said to each other, but whatever Leo said, Attila turned around and went away. And it, it's we, we do believe that there may have been issues of of uh, epidemic and a famine and very, his army wasn't as strong as he hoped it would be, but it may very well be that Pope Leo appealed to him for the fact that what you're doing here can destroy the very thing you want. And that is a place where you can enjoy some peace and some comfort in life. And you're here at the gates wanting to destroy the very thing you're looking for. And so the barbaric tribes settled in various parts of the empire. Sometimes they just settled peaceably. Sometimes they were forced out for instance, when you know when the Huns start, started traveling from the from the Russian steppes across Europe, they drove other tribes ahead of them, and so sometimes the, the barbarian tribes themselves were forced to move someplace else into areas that were part of the Roman Empire. And I'm going to show you a map in just a minute. But the end of the fourth century and the fifth century was a period of time in which the Western Empire, for all intents and purposes, the Western Roman Empire came to an end at the hands of the various barbarian tribes. Yes? Maybe you said this, but doesn't the word barbarian just mean foreigner? Barbarian means, uh, it means a barbular. It literally means somebody who didn't speak Greek or Latin. Yeah. So it is a foreigner. Uh, it was not originally intended to be a derogatory word. It was a descriptive word. If you didn't speak Greek and you didn't speak Latin, then you were a barbular. You know, <coughs> a, barbaric, uh, a barbaric language. And that's where barbarian comes from. So uh, thank you for reminding me that. Um, even before Augustine, even before some of the other things we talked about, the sacking in Rome, we already had a number of specific instances where barbarian tribes, tribes like the Goths and the Vandals and the Huns and uh, the Burgundians and the Franks and uh, various others, uh, were, were wreaking havoc in part of the civilized world. Now, when we talk about the Western Empire, we're mostly not talking about the emperor in Constantinople. But as I mentioned, some of these tribes had come across from Asia, like the Huns, you know, the Mongol horde kind of thing, had come across 
And in doing so, they crossed Asia Minor, and there were battles with the Eastern Empire as well. In 378 AD, a major event, the Roman Emperor uh, Valens was killed in a battle at Adriana Adrianople. I always have trouble pronouncing that, for instance. I have no trouble with Constantinople, but Adrianople is a very difficult one. Um, a group of Gothic rebels, that is Visigoths, and there are various kinds of, of Gothic tribes. They had the same sort of genetic roots, but there were Visigoths and Astrogoths and various other kinds of Goths. But a sort of combined rebel group of Goths attacked the Emperor Valens and the Eastern um, Imperial Army um, in Adrianople, and they killed the Emperor, and this is near the border of Greece and Bulgaria, destroyed his army, took over the city. So this is before most of what we think about as being the, the uh, barbarian problems. The thing that most of us uh, read about, hear about, the, the big one, the one that really sort of started it all in terms of the decline of the Western Empire, was the destruction in 410. Um, I don't I keep saying destruction. The, uh, the Visigoths under their king Alaris took over and sacked the city of Rome, the eternal city. This was the event that everybody panicked over. This was the thing that caused Augustine to have to write the city of God to explain that just because an earthly city, no matter how great you think it was, was destroyed, does not mean that Christianity is wrong or the world is coming to an end or anything else. Then again, in, in 430, as Augustine is dying, the Vandals are besieging Hippo, the city where he was and was uh, where he lived and was bishop. And the Vandals end up controlling all of North Africa and uh, part of Italy. Um, in fact, in 439, the Vandals took to boat and crossed the uh, Mediterranean. Um, they, they took Carthage and then crossed from Carthage over to Italy. They sacked Rome in 455, and the sacking of by the Vandals in 455 was much worse than 410. That's why Vandal today means somebody who destroys something <coughs> senselessly, right? That's where why that's how we got that word because the Vandals were even worse than the Goths and the Huns in terms of the damage that they did when they conquered something. Um, and then, finally, in 476, um, Adoeser, who was head of the Heruli people, one you probably haven't even heard of, all during this time, from 410 to 476, the Huns, the, um, the barbarians were really in control of Italy and Rome. They pretty much called all the shots. But they still allowed there to be, technically, a Western Roman emperor. You had an emperor in the west and an emperor in the east. <coughs> Um, the one in the East was the one that really mattered, the one in Constantinople, but there still was a guy in Rome who claimed to be in charge. During this whole period of time, the Pope was really the most powerful figure, but there still was an emperor. Well, finally, in 476, uh, Odoacer, who was a, a barbarian uh, leader, they, he didn't use the title king, uh, he finally said, oh, okay, enough of that, and he deposed the last Western Roman emperor, who was Romulus Augustulus. Um, fancy name for somebody who was the last of the Western Roman emperors. Now, again, the last of the Western Roman emperors. The Roman Empire continued for over a thousand more years centered in Constantinople. And that we call that the, the uh, Byzantine Empire. Greek language was dominant, although in court they spoke Latin because they thought of themselves as being Romans. Uh, but it's, you know, uh, very, very eastern tip of Europe. Um, Constantinople is between two continents, Europe and Asia. And so this is far out to the east. Western Roman Empire had been destroyed. And the fall of the Western Roman Empire led to a number of independent kingdoms. For instance, this is what it looked like um, by about the year 500. You will notice. You remember the map we looked at where Diocletian separated the Roman Empire into two, Eastern and Western, and he had, a, he had an emperor over each one because he was smart enough to realize one person couldn't do all this anymore? That line pretty much was right here. Now, all of this is still the Byzantine Empire with, with the capital in Constantinople. And again, we use Byzantine to help us differentiate, but they thought of themselves as the Roman Empire. They were the Eastern Roman Empire, okay? But over here, what used to be the Western Roman Empire, you've got the kingdom of the Ostrogoths. Down here in North Africa, um, Corsica, and in some of the islands, you've got the kingdom of the Vandals, 
Now Hippo was down here. Remember they, they conquered Hippo. Um, so you've got Ostrogoths, you've got the Burgundians, which is where we get the region of Burgundy in France now. You've got the Alemanni. What does what does Alemanni mean? German, Aleman. Um, you've got the Lombards, the dis, the ancient ancestors of Carol. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a joke. Carol Lombard. <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> you've got the Gepids that you don't hear a lot about, the Slavs, the Avars, various other Slavic peoples up here, um, the uh, Turanians. Here you've got the Kingdom of the Franks, which Fr the Kingdom of the Franks became France. 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 Um, you've got the Kingdom of the Visigoths, which literally means the Western Goths. I told you there's different kinds of the Ostrogoths, Visigoths, you know, various others. Uh, the Suevi, the Basques, see they were an ancient tribe. The Basque people today um, in the northern part of Spain still claim that ancient heritage. Right? They have their own language, for instance. Um, and so you get this idea, all of these, and up here you've got, of course, the Jutes, the Angles, the Saxons, uh, various, the, the Celtic lands, the Picts, uh, which were the ancient Scottish people, Jutes, Danes, and Saxons over here in, in uh, the, the Danes, you can't trust those Danes. Hey. Um, I watch Danish. Um, so, you get the idea from this, that there were lots of these different groups. The western half of the empire was no longer the Roman Empire. It was broken up into all these other kingdoms. Yes, Joanna? Where did Goths, I mean, where did that word come from? I don't know. I mean, you know, where did Angle or Pict or, you know, um, I'm really not sure. Hmm. Interesting question. I'll see if I can find out. Um, so. You have all of these various activities going on by these barbarian tribes taking over various pieces of land, mostly because they just wanted some place to live. Yes. In what years uh, is about that? This is from um, basically the fifth century. It's about AD 400. I said that in AD 378 was when you know the Gothic rebels just, just killed the Eastern Emperor. Uh, so you're about 400 to the 500s. Another question, what did Barbaria come What's that? Barbarian, where did, where did they come from? Uh -huh. Well, many of them came from up here. For instance, when they talk about the Germanic tribes as being from barbarian, most of these people had started in the northern part of what we know as Germany, which was just outside the boundary of the Roman Empire. Okay, It was just sort of across the river. Some of them came from Russia. When we talk about the Huns and the Goths came from east, um, Various of those started in, in uh, Asia, came across through uh, the uh, Asia Minor, what we know as Turkey, and then into Europe. And the reason was because they had heard about, had experienced the, that there was great wealth and civilization and all the things, you know, you, you, you didn't die when you were 30 years old. You know, these people are comfortable, they eat well, they've got all kinds of stuff. Let's go see if we can get some of that. And so some of them did it by conquering, some of them did it just by trying to settle there. All right, they weren't all bad guys. Yes? Then why did so many burn the cities? Well, the city of Rome was the great prize, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, when I say they weren't all bad guys, they weren't all good guys either. Uh, but again, there are, when you look at all these tribes, there were only a, a very few of them that actually sacked Rome or besieged Rome. And you get people like Adele the Hun who turned around, who's right outside, and turned around and went back. Yeah. You know, so they weren't just bloodthirsty savages, is I guess the point I'm trying to make. That didn't mean that many of these groups didn't settle, didn't make their way by robbing and stealing. Okay? Um, but yeah, they, they weren't, I don't think they were as bad as we generally think of when we say barbarian, which is why it's good to re recognize that all that meant originally was they didn't speak Greek or Latin. Okay? Um, so you've got, you've got all of these people, they're there. The, the weird part about it is most of them were pagan, but some of them weren't. In fact, some of them were Christian, particularly Aryan Christian. Um, the, fairly early on, for instance, the Vandals down here were converted to Christianity, but they were converted when Aryan Christianity, which was a heresy according to the Nicene or the Trinitarian Christianity, the Chalcedonian Christianity, all of that means just orthodoxy, and I don't mean either Eastern Orthodoxy, it's, it's the accepted faith. Um, there were still Aryan ministers around, 
They were, some of them in exile, and wherever they went, they spread this heresy. Well, the Vandals became Arians, and because they were Vandals, they persecuted Christians who weren't Arians. And so we had a renewal of persecution in North Africa against the Nicene belief, the people who followed the, the, the church that was based on the Council of Nicaea, they were persecuted by the Vandals when they took over because they were Arians. So again, that North Africa thing, you've got Arians, you've got the, the Orthodox, Nicene uh, Christians, and you've got Donatists. And so, when from over here in Saudi, I guess down here, in Saudi Arabia, when the Muslims came along, they were pretty easy pickings because they were so split up. So there were places where the, some of the early uh, barbarian tribes that converted were Aryan. Some of them, the Franks uh, up here in France, some of the early members of the Frankish tribes became Aryan. Later on, their king was converted to um, Trinitarian or Orthodox Christianity, and everybody went along with him. All right? In fact, here you get some of the major events of conversion that made such a difference. Um, in, in 496, the Moravian king Clovis converts and is baptized on Christmas Day. Now, interestingly, his wife was Christian. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, she kept saying, if you will follow God, if you will accept Jesus, then he will make you strong. Because that's what they were into, is being strong. Okay. Um, Clopas was involved in a major battle, and he was losing. <laughs> and he prayed and said, okay, God, my wife tells me that you are the one true God, and that you give strength to those who follow you. If you'll let me win this battle, then I'm yours. He ended up winning the battle. He converted and ended up being baptized on Christmas Day, and all of his followers. Now, the Frankish people were actually a combination of a number of other groups that came from the, just like the Goths were sort of originally of the same bloodline, the Franks were the same, but they had various groups that were underneath that. The Burgundians eventually became part of the Franks too. But the Moravians were a Frankish group that eventually were absorbed into the kingdom of the Franks. Later on, 516, so we're talking just um, you know, 20 years later, the king of the Frankish, the united Frankish people of that was King Sigismund. He converted from Arianism to Trinitarian Christianity. All right. So then we have the Franks became a sort of um, very strong believers in Trinitarian Christianity. In fact, when the Muslims invade the Iberian Peninsula, it was the Frankish people. Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, is the one who fought them off. And he was a Frank. He was a barbarian, if you will. Um, his son, Pepin the Short, wouldn't you hate to be a king and become one of his Pepin the Short? <laughs> well, Pepin the Short, who was Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer's son, he eventually decided to get rid of the guy who was king, you know, because he, he was sort of just, he was a king, there was a, a separate king of the Franks. But at that point, um, Pepin said, this is silly for us to have this weakling king. In fact, the, the, the king who at that point was called, uh, uh, was it Chilias the Stupid? Oh! <laughs> that's, his, that's his nickname down through history. Well, he finally forced him to abdicate and become a monk, and Pepin the Short took over as king. Well, the importance of that is that Pepin the, son's, uh, Pepin the Short's son, you might have heard of. He was called Charlemagne, oh, King Charlemagne, a Christian king, who became later the first uh, of the Holy Roman emperors. Because what they did is they tried to reconstitute Western Europe later on under Charlemagne as a new Christian empire, and he was the first king of that. And so he was a barbarian, but his ancestors had converted to Christianity, first Arian Christianity and then Trinitarian Christianity, and then um, Charles Martel, the first, Charles the Hammer, was the first one to, to uh, in France, the Franks, to fight back. His grandson became, was Charlemagne and became the king. Then in 589, you get the Visigoth king, Recarid, converts to Nicene Orthodoxy. And this was kind of weird because on some of these royal families in these barbarian uh, groups, some of them were... Uh, converted by missionaries of the Eastern Church. 
Some of them were converted missionaries of the <coughs> Western Church. So it's a very strange thing. This, this may have been in our book. It's in one of the books I've read. They talked about the fact that it, it got kind of weird because different members of the same royal family, like husband and wife, king and queen, would celebrate Easter on different days. <laughs> Because they, you know, one of them would follow the Eastern calendar and one the Western calendar, which was different. And they, you know, they finally ended up sorting all that out. Uh, but that there, there were complications through all of this. But slowly, the point in this is these barbarian peoples started converting to Orthodox Christian faith. Barbara? I may have had a, a senior moment, but could you refresh my memory on what Trinitarian Christianity yeah, Trinitarian, and there's there's several words I'm using as synonymous, Nicene, okay. or Chalcedonian, or Trinitarian. You'll remember the Arian heresy, which some of these people, you know, were were converted into, said that the Word, which is the Jesus, was not coeternal with the Father. So when we say Trinitarian, we mean the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all three equal co-eternal with one another, as opposed to Arianism that said there was God the Father first and the Son was created later. He wouldn't have said the Son was created later, to be honest. He would say the Word, the Logos, was a created thing, and then the Logos became incarnate in Jesus, uh, which it seems pretty obvious he's saying that the Son was, cre uh, was created, but theologians tend to be pretty picky about the way you word those things, okay? Uh, but that's the difference, is uh, whether they held to the Son being co-equal and co-eternal with the Father or not. And that was established in the Council of Nicaea, which is why we call it the Nicaean faith. It was then really hammered home because Arianism was still around. The Council of Chalcedon, later on, um, they really, I mean, if, if we don't use the, the uh, Chalcedonian Creed very often because it's not as graceful, to be quite honest, as the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. It's not, it, it's harder because they kept having these creeds, and they kept making these decisions, and they, they still couldn't wipe out Ari, the Arian heresy. And the, so the Chalcedonian Council comes along, and they write a creed which, you know, just hammers and hammers and hammers and hammers and hammers on that point. So to read it out loud, it's pretty long, it's much longer. To read it out loud gets a little boring, because they were trying to think, okay, let's think of every possible way we can make this point again so that they can't claim that they don't understand it. Uh, and so if you go right back and you read the Creed of Chalcedon or the Statement of Chalcedon, you know, it's not one we, we use in services because it's, it's kind of ugly. <laughs> but it makes the point. So we talk about Trinitarian or Nicene or Chalcedonian as being those who really affirm the Trinity. Okay? Um, any questions? I, I could get into a lot more detail about the, uh, the barbarian tribes, but I think you get the point. They wiped out the Western Empire. Um, they destroyed the sense, and, and the Dark Ages very literally were the Dark Ages. I mean, they, we do have the Irish to thank. Uh, in fact, let me talk for a minute about uh, monasticism again. I talked about Eastern monasticism, particularly the Egyptian monasticism, where it was in the deserts of Egypt that the Anchorite, that is the individual monks, started, and then they began to develop the Cenobitic or communal monastic communities. But when this comes to Europe, there's one figure that is particularly significant, and that is um, Saint Benedict. He became a saint later, but he was uh, Benedict. He was born in Italy, a small Italian town named Nursia around 480. Now, if you look at these dates, 480 was when the Ostrogoths had complete control, and yet Christianity still existed there. Um, he began to practice, as he, as he grew into a young man, Benedict began to practice a monastic lifestyle on his own. He gained some recognition for being a spiritual leader, um, and people started gathering around him so that he could be their teacher. So he ended up going to Monte Cassino. Um, you, you all ever heard Monte Cassino? Do we have any war, uh, Second World War buffs in the group? The Battle of Monte Cassino, there was a monastery on top of a mountain that was held by the Germans. The Battle of Monte Cassino was one of the most difficult battles on the continent of Europe. Well, that monastery on top of Monte Cassino was the monastery that St. Benedict started. 
okay? At the time when he started it, now obviously different buildings and all that, but the idea of the, the, the Benedictine Monastery in Monte Cassino was begun uh, in the early 500s, and it was the first real mon monastic community of significance in Europe as opposed to be in, you know, in the Middle East, Syria, or even earlier in, uh, in Egypt. So, Benedict comes along, people start gathering to him, so he says, okay, we're gonna, we gotta have some place, if all you people are gonna hang around, we gotta have some place for you to sleep and stuff. They go to Monte Cassino, which in that day was completely the middle of nowhere. In fact, it was so far off the beaten path, they, there was a sacred forest there where the local people still, still uh, sacrificed to the, ancient, the old gods. Okay. This, is, this is in the 6th century. Christianity has been dominant around here for a long time. But this is how remote that was when he first went there. So they turned over the... They basically destroyed all the pagan stuff. You know, and told people, can't do that anymore. They established the monastery. And the most important thing Benedict did, though, is he, he wrote his own rule. Capital R, rule. Meaning, his own instructions for how the monastic community should exist. His sister, Scholastica... <laughs> <laughs> Great name for a sister. She comes along. She creates a nearby monastery for women. So you've got uh, for men, for women. That starts the Benedictine monastic uh, movement, which was one of the most important ones. And the rule of St. Benedict became the model, probably, from that point on, at least in Latin-speaking Europe, not Greek-speaking Egypt, but in Latin-speaking Europe, that became the model for how monastic life should, should occur. The monasteries from that point on began to spread, even though this is when the barbarians are controlling Western Europe and it's not safe in a lot of places, even though some of the barbarians just wanted a place to live, a lot of them were still raping and pillaging. And so people didn't live in cities. And people, people not living in cities, they lost a lot of what they had before. Um, there was very little literacy after 100 years of barbarian rule. People forgot how to read. That wasn't the priority. Staying alive was more the priority. But what happens is from the Benedictine monastery and the influence that that had, either directly from, from uh, Monte Cassino or from other monasteries or from uh, the Pope, like Pope Gregory, who we're going to talk about next week, they started sending people to start other missionary efforts. Well, there's one place in Europe that did not, uh, that's not what I do, that did not get influence. I think I can get it. There we go. If you look at this map, there's only one place on this map where you don't have Ostrogoths and Burgundians and Franks and everything else in all of Western Europe, and that's right there. Okay? Ireland. 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 <laughs> um, Ireland was not conquered by anybody else. The Irish people were barbaric enough for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so nobody came from somewhere else. Well, St. Patrick comes along. Patrick had been the, um, he had lived in Britain. Okay, this, is, this was called Britain. As opposed to, I mean, not, it's Great Britain now, but originally when you, it was the island of Britain. The, in the island of Britain, Patrick lived there as a young boy, and, but the Irish, being barbarians, they would send raiding parties over to Britain to steal stuff, animals, and slaves. He was taken as a young man back to Ireland and lived there as a slave. Eventually he escaped, got back to Britain, he was converted to Christianity, and God laid it on his heart to go back to that place where he had been a slave and convert them. St. Patrick goes back to Ireland, converts the Irish in mass, pretty much the whole country, becomes Christian. They start sending missionaries other places. Particularly, they evangelize Scotland. Okay? They, they, the, there are a number of islands like Iona um, and others where monasteries were established that became the center or base of operations for sending missionaries out into other parts of Britain and elsewhere. Well, because Ireland had been converted and they had monasteries there, and the other barbaric tribes didn't come there because one of the, one of the favorite targets of the barbaric tribes who were warring and who were you know out to steal stuff were monasteries. 
Because monasteries had things like golden candlesticks and jeweled chalices and stuff like that that people would donate to these monasteries. So monasteries were often targets for the barbaric tribes. Well, they never got to Ireland, and so they never burned any of their libraries. And in Ireland, they continued to copy not only the scriptures, but they continued to copy some of the classics right, of Roman literature, for instance, and histories and things of that sort, things they felt like reflected God's grace in, in the world. So that once things calmed down a little bit in Ireland, or in, in England, uh, in, in Western Europe, the Irish missionaries started bringing all this stuff back to Western Europe. It was the, the monastic, or the monasteries in Ireland where learning and libraries and books, so much of what civilization um, was, was made out of, was kept in Ireland and brought back to Europe once things started settling down. Because even after the Ostrogoths and Visigoths and Burgundians and Franks, even after they converted to Christianity, they went, you know, it probably would have been really good if our grandfather hadn't burned all the books. <laughs> and now the Irish brought them all back. The, there, there is a very good book called How the Irish Saved Civilization. And that's the whole point of that book. Thomas Cahill. Cahill's a wonderful writer in a lot of ways. He, he has a, a, another book called the Gift, the Gift of the Jews, which is about Jesus, basically. He has another one called Sailing the, Red, uh, the Wine Red Sea, which is about Greece and the, and the development of Greece as a center for civilization. A um, number of good books, but How the Irish Saved Civilization is about the fact that the Irish monasteries maintained all of this learning and then brought it back to Western Europe once the, the barbarism of the barbarian tribes had, gone, had died down and most of them had become Christians. I wish the title wasn't How the Irish Saved Civilization because that denies the fact that there was still civilization in Constantinople and in the East. I wish he'd said How the Irish Saved Western Europe. But that's not the title, okay? Um, any questions about that? Okay, that's the story of the barbarians and the monastic orders, starting with Benedict in Italy, the Western European monastic orders, and then spreading to Ireland and then bringing civilization back. This is an important part of the history there. Yes, Ron? I, I was wondering, I have never been able to understand Arianism uh, in regards to the Germans thinking it's a superior... Different word. No, no, no. Different word. Arian, Arianism in terms of the religious belief, is named after Arius. A-R-I-A-S. A-R-I-U-S. Arianism. Arian in terms of German Arian is A-R-Y-A-N, and that's based upon an Asian... Uh, source, actually India, the, the Germans. A lot of people don't know that, that they identified the source of the Germanic peoples as being India. And one of the things that Nazi Germans did is they sent a lot of um, expeditions to India to try to find out more about where the Aryan, the swastika, how am I getting into all this stuff? The swastika was an ancient Indian symbol. You know, you find it in Hindu. Uh, iconography, for instance, and that's where it came from. And so, Arianism of that is very different than Arianism from Arius the heretic. Two different things, two different words, spelled differently. Got it? Got it. Yes, Kenneth. Back to the World War II. Totally <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> off, but Monte the Battle of Monte Cassino was that slot just after the the uh, my mind is blank. The, the they invaded from Sicily. Right, they invaded from Sicily. Um, my mind is not blank. Was it the 45th that took that? Is that <coughs> I don't remember the particular okay, divisions. I'm pretty sure that's where my dad was. Yeah, very possible. Because um, <laughs> history of World War II. Yes. <laughs> um, there was a strong disagreement amongst the, the Allied commanders as to where they should invade Europe. Mm -hmm. Most of them believed they should invade here which is where they eventually did, at Normandy. Although they convinced the Germans they were going to invade at Calais, which is a narrower area. Right? This is Calais right here. This is Normandy, okay? But, um, but, but Churchill felt very strongly that they should invade in Italy, that they should come into Italy. And so what they did is, almost simultaneously, and we always hear about the Normandy invasions because it was so dramatic and, and there were so many lives lost and everything else, 
But at close to the same time, they landed in Sicily and then crossed over and invaded um, Italy and came up through here. And, the bat and, so, and they fought their way the whole way. The Germans right. you know, were really, really determined there. And the Battle of Monte Cassino was one of the nastiest ones because they literally were fighting up this cliff. Uh, because the monster sits right on top of this promontory and, and the Germans were sitting up there with artillery. Yeah. Okay, we don't need to talk about it anymore. <laughs> but it is, you know, that is the monastery that was started, you know, that was founded almost 1,500 years before that great battle. And people have heard of Monte Cassino mostly because of that battle. The Battle of Anzio. Yeah. That's what I was no, Anzio, yeah. 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 Which is, which is, yeah, south. Yeah, where they invaded. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop there.